Usually when we think of world building in a film, we imagine shots like these, sweeping wides that establish architecture and environments, or interesting exposition about the world's technology. Only the native tribes known as the Fremen have adapted well enough to survive. But Dune places just as much emphasis on another kind of world building, by establishing many scenes with sensory details from the world instead of wide shots of locations, the film places special emphasis on what the world of Dune feels like. I would call it brain stemmy images. It's appealing to some part of the brain that's old and not necessarily verbal, and they're all very sensory, incredibly sensory. That's Joe Walker, and he's not just the voice of the dictionary in Dune, he's also the film's editor. Walker and director Denis Villeneuve have a well-established partnership, and they have done a lot of amazing work together, but when they tackled Dune, they took on a unique challenge. Dune is a massive book with tons of characters, lots of interesting details, worlds, factions, and ideas to establish before you can even tell the story. So editor Joe Walker was going to need to adopt a slightly less conventional approach to editing to accomplish everything he needed to on screen. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the idea of continuity. Continuity of action is when the action of a scene seems to continue smoothly from one shot to the next. For example, if we look carefully at a moment from the training scene, we can see how an action that starts in this shot continues smoothly into this shot. Most scenes from most movies you watch broadly try to respect or maintain a sense of continuity of action within a scene. But in this moment from Dune, Walker breaks continuity. Give me the water. You can see how the action of this shot and the following two shots don't align. The action does not continue from one shot to the next. In this moment, Walker is breaking continuity of action to signal something important to the viewer. Paul is using the voice to try to influence the Lady Jessica's action, but he fails. The action signified in this shot only takes place in Lady Jessica's mind, not in reality, and the break in continuity helps illustrate that. It's a clever trick that communicates the idea of what's happening very intuitively and effectively to the viewer. And Walker is setting this up as a piece of editing grammar that he can use again in the future to illustrate the use of the voice. This kind of creative use of editing to get concepts across visually is necessary to effectively adapt for screen such a complex and detailed book. I think a very typical cinematic thing is simplicity and economy. Mm -hmm. And we're looking, we were looking for that in the cut, but also paying, you know, our dues to the book and also to the depth of that imagination that Frank Herbert originally had. Look at how at the beginning of the John Gabar scene, there's a shot where Paul comes to a stop, then another shot where he seems to walk forward as the Reverend Mother speaks. but when it cuts back to Paul, we can see that he's still standing in the same spot he was. When she actually uses the voice moments later, there is another break in continuity. Come here, kneel. But this time the action is not reset back in time. Once Walker establishes these breaks in continuity, he doesn't just use them to signal the voice. He also uses them to indicate when something more metaphysical is happening in the film. For example, here during the spice mining scene, when Paul is hit by a wave of spice in the desert, Walker uses a jump cut between two similar images with a shift in focus to help indicate that something strange is happening. It's visually very similar to when the Reverend Mother uses the voice on Paul. While the use of the voice and the visions aren't exactly the same thing, in the world of Dune they're both tapping into the world's metaphysical elements, so it makes sense to use a similar visual language for both. This close-up of Paul that comes immediately before this break in continuity is also very important. It's part of a visual motif that Walker uses at the start of Paul's visions. Look at all the shots that precede Paul's visions. This motif of subjective close-ups places us in Paul's perspective and helps establish the visions. But in this specific case, it signals that a vision is happening even though we don't actually see the vision until later. Actually showing the vision here would break up the suspense and action of this scene. So Walker uses this visual motif as an indicator to the viewer of what's happening. And then later he establishes a flashback to the vision. What did you see? By returning to that same shot 
And so we'd understand visually the movement in time here to when the flashback is taking place, even if we didn't have the dialogue of this scene. These noticeable breaks in continuity of action help signal to us that something unusual or unnatural is happening. But Dune is actually full of many breaks in continuity of action that we don't notice, because the main driving force of the film, I'd like to argue, is not continuity of action, but a different kind of continuity. Dune, if nothing else, is for me one massive uh, work of rhythm. You're probably familiar with the term montage. The popular use of the term refers to what we call montages, or scenes that consist of a collection of shots that are usually disconnected in time, placed together in a rhythm, and usually set to music. Traditional montage technique plays an important role in Dune. Walker uses them to powerful effect to illustrate Paul's visions. But the montage approach to editing can also be used for scenes that we wouldn't traditionally think about as a montage. In this scene, each shot is a contained unit of action. And while they combine to create an impression of continuing action, the action doesn't actually continue fluidly from one shot to the next. It feels cohesive, but see how in this shot they're hammering the stakes, in this shot they're pulling down the tarp, and in this shot the ropes are already wrapped around the stakes? There's a significant jump in time between each shot. Here we're not seeing the thopter being covered as a continuous action, we're seeing a montage of the thopter being covered. So why do these breaks in continuity jump out at us while we don't notice these? Well, while these shots do break continuity of action, in the montage mode they follow a different type of continuity. There's still a continuity between the shots, but instead of continuity of action, it's a continuity of information, of emotion, and of rhythm. You know, my background's in music and You're sound. a composer. There's a lot of similarities, but the main thing is pace and rhythm. To understand how continuity of emotion and information works, let's look at the leaving Caladan montage and examine what each shot or block of shots represents informationally and emotionally. The first four images are of the ships rising out of water, Paul picking some grass, and Paul watching the ships rising out of the water. Informationally, we're seeing the Atreides are preparing to leave, and the water and the grass are emphasized, which stand in contrast to the environment of Arrakis. Emotionally, we get the idea of Paul's connection to the environment and his contemplation of leaving his home planet. Then we get two shots of packing. There's really no clear continuity of action, location, or time between these two shots and the first four, but these two shots are connected to the concept of leaving that has already been established in the first four shots. This is what I mean by continuity of information. Then we get a shot of Duke Leto's hand comforting Lady Jessica, and we instantly can recognize this as an action that's most likely responding to her nervousness about leaving. This connects emotionally to the earlier shot where Paul is contemplating leaving. This is what I mean by continuity of emotion. Then the montage cuts back to Paul in a new location, but informational continuity is maintained because we can see the ships are higher in the sky and the departure is progressing. And there's this shot of Paul's hand in the water, maintaining the informational continuity with the earlier shot of the grass and the emotional continuity with the idea of Paul's connection to the environment. And finally, we get a shot that seems to convey Paul trying to feel determined in the face of the unknown, which has a strong emotional continuity to this shot. So even though these shots are dramatically disconnected in time and space, it all feels cohesive because we can easily follow an emotional and informational narrative that's unfolding. I want to be clear this doesn't mean the audience is consciously thinking about what each shot means. The power of images is that they can communicate what I just broke down with words a lot faster than I can because they're doing it on an intuitive, nonverbal level. The brainstemmy images that Walker talked about aren't just great ways to establish a scene, they're also powerful tools within montage to communicate complex emotional ideas on a nonverbal level. There's no handbook or formula you can follow here. While continuity of action has a clear physical logic, continuity of emotion and information don't. You just have to develop a sense of what the audience will be feeling as they watch. I think the most important thing an editor does is has an imaginary audience over his or her back. You're probably picking up on the fact that the distinction between the montage mode of editing and continuity editing is not a clear binary, and sometimes the line between the two modes gets pretty fuzzy. 
You can even have a sequence that acts as a montage of many scenes with continuity of action, mixed together with individual shots that are out of continuity. As long as you respect the continuity of rhythm, emotion, and information, it will make sense to the audience. An example of a scene that exists in this middle space is the John Gavar scene. Here, except when the voice is used, the action of the scene maintains physical continuity of action. But there are shots that interject that align with continuity of information and emotion that tell us a story about what Paul is experiencing subjectively. But the main reason these shots actually work in this scene is because the driving force of the moment is actually continuity of rhythm. The music, performances, editing, and sound design are all working together to build towards a climax. Enough. So that rhythm could be, you know, the sound of a thumper, or it could be the raising of an eyebrow by Stephen McKinley Henderson. Rhythm in film is most obviously created in this way by using sound design, score, and the rhythm of the actual cuts themselves. But how is rhythm created by the raising of an eyebrow? When you turn the sound off, you become hyper aware of people's eyes, and I feel like eyes, that's a serious part of what we do, is like driving the cut by the expression in the eyes. The timing of an action within a shot and the distance between the end of an action and a cut create a rhythm and pace for each shot. Look at this three shot sequence. Do not trespass in our lands. The desert was ours long before you came. It feels fluid and seamless, but watch again if I adjust the shot of Paul by removing only a few frames. Do not trespass in our lands. The desert was ours long before you came. It's a more jarring cut because I'm cutting too close to the movement of Paul's eyes. It's easy to miss, so here's the original. The desert was ours long before you came. And here's my botched cut again. The desert was ours long before you came. This tiny adjustment breaks the continuity of the rhythm of the scene. It's almost imperceptible, but there's a rhythm to this shot. The time between the cut and when Paul starts moving his eyes is a beat, while Paul is moving his eyes is a beat, and then again between the end of the action of his eyes moving and the next cut is a final beat. And when we cut in such a way that breaks the rhythm of that action with the cuts, it feels more jarring. One little cut that's off like this doesn't feel like a big deal, but if you pile up enough of these within a scene, the continuity of rhythm is destroyed. This scene isn't even a montage and continuity of rhythm still matters. If you're jumping around in time and space, continuity of rhythm becomes even more important. What's incredible here to me is that even with the strength of Zimmer's score, Walker doesn't just sit back and let it do all the heavy lifting. To research this video, I watched Dune entirely without sound, and it has a strong visual rhythm and flow even without the rhythm of the sound. Pulling that off requires an incredible attention to detail and a strong intuitive sense of what works emotionally and rhythmically. The best way to develop that intuition as an editor is to watch lots of great films, practice editing yourself, and to listen to the perspective of experienced editors who do quality work. For a long time, the Art of the Cup podcast series has been one of my favorite resources for in-depth interviews with some of the greatest editors in film and TV. So I was very excited to see that the Frame.io Insider was bringing the Art of the Cut in video form to YouTube. I've been enjoying the Art of the Cut interviews for years, and I've learned so much about editing from these interviews. People often ask me where I've learned what I know about film, and honestly, I've learned most of it from filmmakers themselves in interviews and behind-the-scenes content like Art of the Cut. So if you enjoyed my breakdown of Dune, Joe Walker goes into a lot more detail in the full interview. You're trying always as an editor to be in parallel or ahead of the audience, slightly ahead, not too far ahead and never behind. Right. If you're behind, you're dead. I highly recommend watching the rest of the interview and subscribing over there so you can watch more episodes. Click the link in the description to subscribe to the podcast or click the link on the screen to watch the video now. And thank you so much to the Frame.io Insider for sponsoring this video and making it possible. The Frame.io Insider is a fantastic filmmaking blog with in-depth guides, articles, and tutorials for experienced and aspiring editors, producers, cinematographers, colorists, and anyone who's interested in filmmaking. 